This is a CBC Podcast. From the smallest subatomic particles to the largest objects in the sky, Quirks and Quarks is there. Every week, host Bob McDonald presents the people behind the latest discoveries in the physical and natural sciences. Go to cbc.ca slash quirks for podcasts, downloads, and more. Well, there's an information session in Moncton tonight about a disorder that may affect many people in the region. The Canadian Hemochromatosis Society is holding the free public presentation. Hereditary hemochromatosis is an inherited genetic disorder which causes the body to absorb and retain too much iron. The Society's Executive Director, Bob Rogers, will be at the session tonight. He's in our studio this morning, along with Joanne Legasse of Moncton, and she lives with the disorder. Welcome to both of you. Thanks for coming in this morning. Thanks for having us. Now, Joanne, you're living with this disorder, how can, you know, absorbing and retaining too much iron affect someone? To give us an idea of what this disorder well, feels like. Physically and emotionally both, um, it takes a toll on your body, for sure. I mean, you feel tired often, and you have headaches, and you're thirsty, and you just, you get to the point sometimes where you don't quite understand everything that's happening. So how did you find out you had it? Uh, I developed quite a bit of symptoms that led me to go and see my doctor after months of deciding, you know, trying to diagnose myself with, you know, what exactly was happening. But after a while, you just don't have any more guesses. So you just go and see your doctor and they start testing. And it took about three or four weeks of testing before they decided to test for hemochromatosis. Now, this, uh, you know, it surprises me, and I was surprised by some of the uh, stats that I was reading this morning, um, that it's, you know, one of the most com- the common, most common genetic disorder in, in Canada, yet, this, you know, it, it's a new one to me. So, Bob, why, why do we know so little about it? It's not on the radar of doctors, uh, Jonah. The, the fact is, is that um, uh, this is a hidden condition. It's a genetic condition. And so the symptoms present, and the symptoms can be as mild as some of the ones that Joanne mentioned, but they can be quite severe as well. So diabetes or liver cancer or or liver disease, um, arthritis and so on. And when a doctor sees those symptoms in the very short time we have with doctors these Mm. days is that they treat the primary uh, symptom or illness and they say, okay, well, take this and and do this and then you'll be well. Uh, But they don't look for the underlying cause. The question we should always have is why do we have this condition but that gets failed to, to, to be asked and so um, people go on for five to ten years often before getting diagnosed because there's such a, a lack of awareness and um, and then when it finally clues in to a doctor that may have this on their radar then what they do is they uh, test this two simple tests for this and when they do those tests and the ferritin uh, which is the iron stored iron in the body is elevated and the transferrin saturation which is the amount of iron in in motion within the um, within the body when those commit positive a genetic test confirms the result and that's when someone gets to know and by that time damage could already be done in the body so it's just a, a lack of awareness once upon a time we didn't know what uh, colitis or crohn's or alzheimer's or or cholesterol even was but it's through the efforts of organizations like ours who uh, need to bring awareness to this to this situation and so here we are uh, in a in an area by the way that has this very much in its population because this affects Celts and uh, Europeans uh, because of the Vikings uh, having brought this into their populations and then how we've uh, gone into the new world as it were and and uh, taken it with us what prompted you to get involved boy I've been in nonprofit work since I was 28 years of age I'm 61 now and uh, six years ago this organization was trying to put a, a find someone with enthusiasm and passion to help people. And uh, I saw this as an opportunity uh, to spend the rest of my years in uh, doing something that would bring this out to the light. So here I am and uh, traveling across Canada. I'll be going out as far as Sydney on this trip and then back to Vancouver. And uh, it's all about awareness and uh, we're going to make that happen. So Joanne, once you were were diagnosed, uh, talk about the treatment that, that you underwent. Uh, treatments was quite, for me, dramatic. Um, 
I am not a fan of needles, so just going for blood work was a panic on its own. Um, and then when I learned about phlebotomies and how big those needles were. <laughs> yeah, phlebotomies are, are giving blood, a pint of blood. That's mm. the treatment because yeah. then you leach yeah. the iron out from the Okay, home. okay. Yeah, so that alone was um, a learning curve. And then, of course, I knew very little about the, you know, the disorders. So it's, you know, that's when I reached out to Bob from the very get-go. And he became, you know, someone I just call and, and get information from and really became to be more at ease with the knowledge of everything and, and how I'm supposed to expect certain things and, and be okay and whatnot. Um, but treatments are, for me, still ongoing, will be for the rest of my life. And as well, um, it's always a challenge for me because when I go in, they, um, they, find, they find it very difficult sometimes to, to do draw blood. I have very, very fine veins. They don't always want to cooperate. And you have to drink lots. If you don't drink lots, you know, you run into problems. When did you start feeling better? Uh, well, I've been diagnosed for three years now. And I would say in the last year is when I really started to feel a difference where I feel um, I will go about a month where I'm not so tired after you know, going in for phlebotomies and stuff like that. But I, I still find that your body t still takes a toll on its own, mm -hmm. you know. But it's it, it does get better, but then it kind of deteriorates us on its own, too, sometimes. And how common is that uh, type of experience, Exactly. It, it, that's exactly how it works. People, mm -hmm. uh, it takes a long time to feel better, uh, to get over the chronic fatigue, the the uh, uh, symptoms that uh, Joanne spoke about. Um, but uh, eventually they do come back and um, and feel well and vibrant again. And, uh, and then the nice thing is, uh, incidental to this, once someone like Joanne gets diagnosed... Then we do familial studies. We, we test the entire family genetically, and we're able to find people that have the disorder as well right within the family. So if we find one person in a family, we can potentially help uh, an extended family, which is you know, a wonderful result. So, yeah, I mean, I can see how helpful that would be if you can, if you can actually target people rather than them you know, sitting home not feeling well and wondering what, what's wrong with them. What, what kind of advantage does that give them um, if they start that treatment? Oh, really well, that, thank you for asking asking that question because uh, you know typically we find men in their 40s uh, women in their 50s with this disorder and if we can and damage has already occurred if we can find th that individual then we can find the younger members of the family and get them into treatment in their 20s to 30s and then they can have a life without symptoms and and go on to live a long life often when we find a man in his late Late forties or fifties, they'll be uh, they'll have a fatal disease by the time they're sixty, and their life will be ended prematurely. And their contribution to the community and to, and to, and to their workplace and to their family is lost at a very early time. So what we're trying to do is prevent this from happening. And in my presentation tonight, I'll be talking about how this actually can be traced and what this disorder actually causes, and how we're going to try and help people. Get this, uh, get this addressed. And for people um, who uh, may not be aware of a family member who has this disorder, but may be susceptible, because you were talking about uh, earlier, but you know the numbers, especially in this region, higher than, than other places yes. uh, in, in the country. So, so what is your advice to people who aren't quite sure if they should be screened or, or not? Our website is too much iron t o o much iron dot c a, and if you go there, there's a list of symptoms that uh, that that. Uh, you can read. And if you have two or three of those symptoms, otherwise unexplained, uh, you should get tested for this disorder. And that's the chance of getting uh, diagnosed early, uh, insist with your physician to get those two tests if you have two or three of those symptoms. And by and large, uh, many of those people then would pop up with this disorder. So Joanne, going, you know, having gone through what you went through, what would your advice be to, to people either, you know, wondering if they have it or who just found out that they, they have this disorder? Uh, well, like, you, like Bob just mentioned, one, visit the website, 
see if any of those symptoms are something that um, you live with. And if, the, if you do, um, don't be afraid to speak to your doctor. Because many doctors, you know, they know maybe of the condition, but they don't know the, you know, the depth of the condition. And therefore, um, specialist is really who you want to see. And often, you know, doctors are even relentless on sending you to specialists. Um, so really push for yourself. I mean, it's the only way for you to get better if you don't fight to get your doctor to send you to get the treatments. Hmm. One of the things I'm thinking about as I sit here with uh, Joanne in studio is that um, a lot of women uh, are told they are anemic. They have too little iron. But that iron is the iron they measure in the bloodstream. It's, it's, it's the amount of iron in the blood. What we're looking for is iron in the body, stored iron in the body when we do these tests. So a lot of women present anemic and yet they may have too many iron stores in their body. And that's what we're looking for. And so it's quite common that uh, doctors would say, oh, you don't have a problem with iron. Uh, and they haven't checked for the stored iron in the body. Mm, interesting. Yeah, that's uh, definitely something to keep in mind. Thanks so much to both of you for, for coming in. I wish you well, Joanne, with your with, with your treatment and uh, and with your awareness campaign, Bob. I know a lot of people will appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you uh, too much iron. Ca and our and our toll free number in Canada is one eight seven seven bad. Iron. Bad iron. Okay, got it. All right, thanks so much for coming in this morning. That's Joanne Legacé. She lives in Moncton. She has hemochromatosis. Bob Rogers is executive director of the Canadian Hemochromatosis Society based in uh, BC. The free public presentation takes place in Moncton tonight at 7 o'clock in the Fundy Room at the Futures Inn at Lady Ada Boulevard. And again, at too much iron.ca is the website. 1877 Bad Iron is the toll free number to call. Looking for more CBC Podcasts? Go to cbc.ca slash podcasting.